I now want to introduce uh, Olav. Our next session is going to be about global tech. So the type of innovation that goes on across boundaries geographically, where we see a lot of leapfrog innovation. Olaf uh, joined us from Yale about a year or so ago. Uh, he is the faculty research director for the Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, he's got a lot of plans to continue growing the research, the course offerings, et cetera, at Anderson, all related to entrepreneurship and, uh, and innovation. Um, his research is very much focused about entrepreneurship and how it affects certain geographic regions, how it affects growth in those regions, competitiveness in those regions, et cetera. Olaf, please uh, come up, and it's great to have you here. Great. Uh, thank you, Terry, for the uh, introduction. I'm uh, happy to be here. And one of the things that uh, uh, he didn't mention in my biography, but I think is one of the reasons why I'm particularly excited about this session is that you know, over the last decade, I've led uh, entrepreneurship-themed student trips to Estonia, Hungary, Russia, South Africa, and there's a lot of interesting things uh, that are happening, you know, kind of around the world uh, in technology entrepreneurship. So, you know, to frame the discussion, I'd like to uh, mention just a couple of, I think, you know, sort of interesting tidbits that uh, people may not be aware of. So. Um, you know, when I started, I'm teaching a course on venture capital. When I started teaching venture capital 15 years ago, uh, you could basically teach that just about the U.S. In fact, you could almost teach that just about California because there wasn't much happening uh, in other parts of the world. Um, but that's really dramatically changed. If you looked at the last, you know, two or three years, um, there are essentially as many deals just in China as there are in the United States. And if you start adding up other places around the globe, there's actually more happening outside the US uh, than in the US. Um, and that's even true on a dollar value basis. So even the, the number of dollars being deployed is larger outside the US uh, than inside it. And I think what we're seeing is just the beginning of a wave. If you looked for the last, you know, sort of 12 to 18 months on a per capita basis, you know, what have been the fastest growing, you know, kind of tech areas? Where has VC been most active? Um, San Francisco, the Bay Area, is not even in the top five. Uh, the top five would include Amsterdam, Dublin, London. Um, so I think that, you know, this kind of trend that we're seeing is, is only going to continue. And accelerators are popping up, you know, kind of everywhere uh, around the world. So. Uh, we have a really interesting panel here today. Um, we have uh, Marim Dieng, uh, who's going to be joining us. Uh, she is with the company formerly known as 500 Startups. Um, fortunately, the name change was not quite as extreme as Meta. Uh, and we also have uh, Xenia Tata uh, joining us, um, who was formerly with the uh, XPRIZE. Um, so before I uh, let them briefly introduce themselves, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, we're going to be using Slido for the questions. I have this uh, handy iPad, so I will see your questions popping up. Um, the uh, uh, code for this session is TNSP1. Uh, and for those of you who uh, like the NATO code signs, we can go for Tango, November, Sierra, Papa, and the number one. Um, so uh, with that, uh, maybe uh, we can have the, the panelists give just a very brief introduction uh, to themselves. Maureen, would you like to start us off? Thank you so much, um, Olav. So um, as he just mentioned, my name is Marem. I lead our global innovation strategy at 500, um, looking particularly at Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and especially because as just previously mentioned, venture capital today is definitely more active in emerging markets. And so I look at our strategy, both in implementing ecosystem development work, as well as understanding where are the underlying markets where there is the highest investment potential. And Xenia? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Olaf. Um, I'm Xenia Tata, and I have had the absolute privilege for the last 20 years to watch this entire innovation landscape, especially in the global south, absolutely explode. 
Um, this has just been part of my career journey. I was last uh, uh, for the last eight years with XPRIZE as the chief impact officer, where I designed prizes and des designed impact programs. And uh, my entire career journey has been about designing innovation for high impact, the kind of innovation that truly can transform the lives of, of many. Great, so. thank you. So I, I think an interesting you know, kind of place to start would be to say, you know, what are some of the places that you find particularly exciting right now? You know, both of you have had experiences you know, kind of around the world and you know, there's different pockets, different ecosystems popping up and, and I'd be curious which ones you think are, are currently really interesting. Uh, maybe we could start uh, with uh, Xenia. So uh, I think Olaf, you're asking about geographically but right. I'm going to talk a little bit about sector-wise, if that's all right with you. Um, sure. So I think some of the most interesting innovations that are popping up for me are, are in climate tech. And um, I'm really uh, tracking those and trying to figure out. Um, now, of course, the, these climate tech innovations, some of the beauty about them is that these are multi-country efforts. So you can't say that it's just in one hotspot of innovation or another. And that's, that's kind of part of the charm of them as well. Because again, when you're dealing with climate, you're dealing with such a massive global issue. So uh, for me, I've been tracking a lot in climate tech recently. Miriam. Miriam. Thank you, Zenia. Um, I would say that for me, and I'm probably a little biased um, because I am from, from Senegal, that there are quite interesting um, companies that we're seeing come out of particular emerging markets. So I specifically think of um, the different fintechs that have been coming out of Nigeria in the past few years. Um, but I also think about um, the different companies coming out of Egypt, both in edtech, fintech, um, e-commerce and logistics, um, and also as well, Kenya, uh, which today we're seeing a quite active um, unlocking of industries in agri-tech. And so, like Zenia said, I think there are interesting companies coming out of many different sectors. Um, but if I had to say the geographies that I am definitely the most excited about, um, those are geographies that we see today on the African market, as well as the MENA region, uh, for that matter. So very exciting companies coming out of UAE, Saudi. Um, so it's a very exciting time for a lot of different emerging markets. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of that come up in the next coming years. Yeah, Marim, could I uh, follow up on that maybe? So, you know, what do you think is really driving some of the innovation in these places? So, you know, I, I know, I, I'm, you know, some of it could be driven by local needs, but of course the other thing that we know is happening is, you know, places like near Nigeria are just having a, a boom in the sort of the middle class. Mm -hmm. So is it, you know, kind of general increase in demand? Is it differences in needs that, what do you think is happening? I think there's two very exciting phenomena that are happening in those in those markets. And the first one, I think, has been the realization that technology can solve um, primary issues. And I think for a long time, there was kind of this... Um, narrative that technology can only be applied to higher needs on the pyramid of Maslow. And nowadays, what we realize is actually that technology can allow us to exponentially and in a much more sustainable and scalable manner, address some of the most primary and important issues of the continent. And being able to, that empowerment and that realization, I think has tremendously changed the landscape. And, and you were mentioning earlier, so Nigeria today, what we're seeing is that the capacity at which um, startups have taken over fintech and uh, financial services in order to allow a much bigger amount of the population to have access to those financial services has tremendously changed um, the, the landscape of the country and as well has actually catalyzed the growth of this middle class that we're talking about because it has allowed a distribution um, of services. And then the second thing that I also think is happening across those different markets is the realization that they have the potential to go from 
technology and innovation consumer to technology and innovation producer. And I think that that has made a major, major shift across those markets as well, um, because today we're seeing them wanting to drive and lead emerging technologies and their adoption. And we often talk about the concept of leapfrogging, which is when different markets are actually able to skip um, certain phases of technological development. And I see that as an incredible competitive advantage and strength of these markets because it's allowing them to go much faster in adoption and it's allowing them to actually be and turn into case studies for what the penetration of emerging technologies would look like. Um, I'm always very pleasantly surprised when I hear in remote areas of Senegal people talking to me about their crypto wallet, right? Those are individuals who do not have bank accounts, who barely have access to, to, to computing technology, as a matter of fact, but they are a lot more savvy on crypto wallets than other individuals who I know who are middle class in certain Western markets. So I'm incredibly excited uh, for, for these markets. And I really think that the shift is happening because there is a level of empowerment that's happening and also um, actual case studies that prove that technology can solve some of the most important issues of the continent. Mm -hmm. Xenia, do, do you feel similarly as to what's sort of driving this or do you think there are other factors, maybe particularly if we sort of think outside of Africa, Southeast Asia and other areas, mm -hmm. um, is it a different type of dynamic? Yes, I think there are a few other factors as well, and I'll get into them in a second. But I wanted to comment on, on uh, what I was thinking, uh, Miriam, when you were speaking, is that, you know, in uh, the mid kind of 2000s, what we were seeing is, uh, you know, this burst of entrepreneurship just starting out um, in, in other countries to address issues like water and energy and waste, et cetera. Uh, so, and health, of course, you know, so, so again, down on, on that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but they were being addressed with very basic technology. You know, the kind of technology that, that probably existed here in the West uh, of many decades ago. And now what we're seeing is um, uh, the confluence of the exponential technologies and the emerging tech actually being used to solve some of those bigger problems, which allow for those problems to be solved uh, faster, uh, in a more affordable way, and also at much greater scale. Than, than sort of the, the older analog versions of technology that we were seeing. So um, other things that make up that enabling environment, um, I, I think is that governments have got more savvy about being real partners and bringing um, partnerships to the table that focus on improved policy and ease of business in certain cases. Um, and, and so again, when governments come on board as partners, of course, everybody thrives, especially in countries where uh, the government presence is very large and, and you have to work through those bureaucratic barriers. So easing, easing that has, has helped, uh, for example, in, in a country like India, uh, that, that has happened, uh, especially in, in though it is, India still remains a very difficult country to do business in, but the government has made efforts, especially in the last eight years or so, to open up doors, especially for entrepreneurs to, to have ease of business. And then I think the, the diaspora um, uh, in a lot of countries, the, the people who came to Silicon Valley in the 90s made, made some good money going back home, have encouraged uh, and become VCs, become angel investors, and have encouraged entrepreneurship through the example of their own success and teaching risk teaching the rewards of risk, teaching the ability to fail, which traditionally doesn't exist in so many of our cultures. So I think those are a couple of the other factors that have enabled uh, this, this uh, spark to blossom. Uh, that's interesting. Do, I, I'm curious, um, uh, Marem, do you think there's also been a di diaspora aspect mm -hmm. in, in kind of Africa's uh, latest wave of emer uh, emergence? I know that you know, you went to ALA and that was actually founded kind of a, around the idea of creating that type of diaspora. A hundred percent. And I think that 
me and many other ALA students are a testimony uh, of what Zenia was just talking about today, which are um, Africans who had had the chance and the opportunity to go and learn from these markets, but who also very still rooted within their culture and within their cultural realities, and who are coming back not as saviors, but who are coming back to try to understand and to try to create more opportunities based on what I they have seen. And I think that that has definitely changed the landscape on the possibility to unlock more for the continent, but also the perspective of how do you actually use international best practices to relate them to what's happening on the continent? Because before, I think also a lot of you know, the, the frustration came from the fact that the examples that were being taken were not very examples that could be replicated on the continent. You can't take what's happening in Paris and London and try to replicate it somewhere in, in Nairobi or in Dakar. But now we're seeing more and more also the diaspora go in places like India, Malaysia, Singapore, go to markets that have actually historically experienced similar issues or that have similar infrastructural hurdle and take best practices from those markets as well. I think about Brazil, Mexico. So looking a lot more outside of the scope of what is the best that can be taken from what's happening elsewhere, but also how can it be actually adapted to the realities of today? And I have to say that today, more than ever, the quality of the local talent is absolutely astonishing. I have been traveling across the continent this year and the local talent of people who have been on the continent, who have been working there for the past couple of years and built their career there. So they need to go to education abroad or they need to work abroad. The talent of that, the quality of the talent pool has exponentially grown. And so today what we're seeing is that there is also a lot of best practice being learned from the continent itself. I keep telling entrepreneurs that they can find a lot of lessons learned from going to Nairobi, from looking at the work happening in Lagos, from learning about what um, Casa is doing in Morocco, because now the ecosystem is growing and we're really being able to actually nurture that growth. So I, 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 I want to dig into this just a little bit. So what do you think have been some of the you know, maybe key additions in a sense to the ecosystem that's really, you know, kind of allowed some of these places to take off. What wasn't there before? Was it the money? Was it the, you know, having the kind of models to follow? Uh, I'd, I'd be curious what your perspective is there. Of course, capital uh, is is one of them. And, and, you know, we would be naive to not acknowledge that capital definitely does make a difference in being able to create more distributed opportunities, uh, for sure. But I also think that something that wasn't there before and that's here today is success stories. What we're seeing now today is that you don't need to go looking at what's happening in other countries to know that it's possible to be done right here. Because today we have actual examples to look at and to learn from. Flutter wave is one of them. All pay is another one. Thinking about also Paystack, Andela, Fari, all of those are actual companies that were built on the continent that have most of their market on the continent and that have built job opportunities that have created a redistribution of opportunities for those that were working on it. And so that tangible, people usually, I think, neglect the importance of tangible outcome, tangible stories, right? When you're thinking about what would the development of the continent look like in the next 10 years, it's right here. We can actually see it now today. We can see what is it like when we're able to leverage on technology to create opportunities and to actually create economic development on the continent. And so that in itself has completely changed the landscape. Today, people are actually looking at people like E as a role model, they can actually personalize and create a direct relationship between what does that success and growth look like for them. And finally, what I think the continent has now and hadn't had before is also time. It takes time for this development to happen. And that's something we sometimes forget that most of these countries are basically 
maximum 70 years old. We're talking about an extremely young content with young economies and young infrastructures that are yet to be developing. And now we're at the dawn of what we're seeing success to, to look like, but we still need time and it will take time. And kind of allowing that process to happen is also a very key part of understanding that we are all today part of building an ecosystem that we may not see the result of, and that should be okay. We should be okay of the idea of participating in building the foundation of an economic development that we may never see because it's going to be in the next 100, 200, 300 years. But that acceptance, I think, really makes a difference in being able to also provide perspective to how that growth is happening and how rapidly it's happening. Great. Uh, Zinia, do you think it's sort of a similar issue in, say, Southeast Asia, or are there different factors at play there? I think one factor uh, that we should discuss and add to is the role of industry. And um, so, for example, if I look at India and where where the sparks happened, where this movement started and bubbled up, these were hotbeds of, and they, they were emerging industries at the time too, but they were hotbeds for IT, uh, for medicine, uh, for, for healthcare services rather, you know, that's, uh, so, so there was a role that industry played where they didn't want to see their talent leave their shores either. And so, they understood that they have to nurture this new wave and, uh, and somehow feed it because uh, this is, again, that rising tide that will lift all boats. And it does play into that longer vision of success, economic upliftment and success, um, not just for a country, but a whole entire region. Uh, so I think the role of industry... Um, um, you know, has been important, especially in Southeast Asia, where, where those clusters did exist. And then, of course, with that comes, you know, again, a different kind of a role model, right? That, well, you could be, you could, you could be a mega industry one day. You, you also, that pathway was open to you, you know. Um, the role of education, um, you know, educational institutes, um, again, talking a little more on the Asia side, because that's more of my familiarity. Um, in Southeast Asia, right now, a lot of the, the premier universities have accelerator programs, have entrepreneurship programs, have uh, their alumni uh, seeding um, a new, new ventures that, that come out of that particular university. So again, the government on one side, fantastic role models from diaspora or even local role models emerging, but then the influx of the support from industry and, and the support from universities themselves to actually teach that mindset. That has been a game changer. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a question that came in from the audience, which I think is an interesting one to think about in this perspective, which is, you know, is there anything that you know, well-established countries, uh, or if we're going to use the, the opposite of the global south euthanism, the global north, I guess, uh, like the U.S. can learn from uh, these emerging regions. Or, you know, maybe another way of thinking about that, is there, are there things that are being done particularly well there um, that the U.S., Europe, other places could learn from? I think that... Um, to, there was a point that was made earlier about how today we're seeing more even investment activity happen outside of um, Silicon Valley, which was historically kind of, kind of the hub of that. For me, when I am looking at, again, um, how the investment landscape has evolved, I would love for, you know, American-based startups to refocus their initial approach towards entrepreneurship around solving problems. I think that um, something they could really learn from emerging markets is, well, you have emerging markets that would have tons of problems and that are now trying to leverage emerging technologies to solve those problems. And I would love for American startups to also recenter and refocus their approach and use of emerging technologies around solving problems 
problems and not necessarily creating problems to solve, because that creates an incredible difference in the sustainability of these solutions on the long term, but also it will allow them to truly have two to five to 10 steps ahead of where the world will be in the next coming years and how their solution can also then be applicable and deployed in other markets. So it's really that thinking ahead of as the world and other economies are also growing and with the status of where the U.S. economy is today, how can they adapt emerging technologies to solve the U.S.'s issues today and even prepare for the next coming issues in other emerging markets? And I think that will truly give them a differentiating factor that it will allow these solutions to be sustainable. Otherwise, what we, we fear to see is that in the coming years with Emerging technologies begin being absolutely leapfrogged in, in emerging markets. And, um, you know, US-based companies not necessarily always working on solutions that are actually solving problems. They actually may miss out on the future um, and miss out on what technology and emerging technologies in particular will truly do. And I and I I, I re-emphasize something that Dana actually said earlier, which was that. The true magic happened when emerging markets are now figuring out how to not just use basic technology, they are using emerging technology to solve their issues. So they have done that, you know, two step ahead already because they are not even looking at now regular technologies. They went, you know, a lot of markets on the continent, for example, have already given up the idea of credit card and bank. It's not even something that they think would be viable. And so... And the, the funny part is, for example, here in Europe, the adoption of mobile money is incredibly difficult to get because there's a lot of infrastructural change that needs to be done before they get there. And so I really, really encourage um, startups in the US and in more developed markets in general to really try to think about that five to 10 step ahead, which is where will the world be in 10 years? And what will those issues look like? And how can I already start with the access to technology that I have now solving for those? Great. Xenia? Yeah, so um, I'm always fascinated by, by entrepreneurs who take on a big problem, but have to quickly design for unprecedented scale. And that is something that you don't see quite in the US. You know, you see, or um, um, you, you, just, you just see the usual kind of uh, plodding through those steps of scale up. Whereas um, when you're dealing with uh, even, even a problem, whether it's, whether it's, you know, leapfrogging the financial system or leapfrogging transportation, traditional transportation systems, whatever it might be, you have to design for such massive scale and, and, and rapid adoption. And so you have to adapt so quickly, you know, whether, whether it's, it's a piece of hardware or software. I mean, your, your market is growing so fast and, and it is so very, Varied because uh, a lot of uh, uh, these countries are extremely varied, right? They're, they're, they are really a collection, even in India, it's a collection of, of multiple tribes, really, you know? So, so you're navigating all these, these cultural differences at breakneck speed while you're growing your company, while you're adapting your technology, and while you're gaining new market momentum, uh, all the time looking behind your shoulder because you know the copycats are right there because that's part of the culture. You know, success is going to be imitated and uh, flattery or not, you know, however you want to view that. And so, uh, so I think that's, um, that's something that, that in the West uh, entrepreneurs uh, don't have to grapple with for a while. Scale kind of, they have the luxury of waiting and planning for scale. Whereas that doesn't happen in the emerging markets. Yeah, that's interesting. I almost feel like those might be flip sides of the same issue in a sense, where you know, if you're really solving a core you know, problem that, that it faced, you know, a lot of people face, then once you have the solution, you know, the demand is almost instantly there, right? And you need to scale up the production of it for that demand you know, kind of right away. Whereas you know, if you're trying to basically create the demand through marketing, you know, that's a you know, kind of slower uh, process. Um, super interesting. Yeah. So 
I'd like to, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, exciting, interesting stuff going on. Um, what's holding it back? What's keeping it from, you know, being kind of emerging at an even more breakneck pace? What are the kind of key features that you think is uh, preventing these ecosystems from having an even larger number of uh, successful startups than they have? Like I said earlier, I would say that for me, it's time. Um, they have finally unlocked um, that critical moment where they realize that it works, um, that it's not just theory, it's not just predictions, it actually works. Um, people's lives are being changed by these solutions. Um, they are finally now attributing change and growth to not just the public sector. Um, they are realizing that a individual entrepreneurs can change completely their way of living and the opportunities that they have access to. So they themselves are now internalizing what that looks like. And especially in markets like Africa, but also Southeast Asia and Latin America, entrepreneurship is not new at all um, to, to their way of functioning because it has been a very strong pillar to their economic development for the past couple of years. And so they have most of the time attributed that entrepreneurship power to building mainly small and medium sized businesses. So SMEs for the most part. And now that they have unlocked um, that very important piece around being able to leverage technology to solve issues, I think their most important need is going to be around time, uh, giving them the time, but also for us as ecosystem stakeholders to continue making sure that we are allowing them to have opportunities. And I reinforce on that very importantly, because at 500, we believe that talent is equally distributed, but opportunities are not. And so there is talent everywhere, and they are um, incredible entrepreneurial potential in all markets, but opportunities are not necessarily distributed. So you can find amazing solutions being built um, in certain markets, but they don't have access to neither the capital nor the network, nor um, the mentorship that they need. And so what we can continue to do as ecosystem stakeholders is to continue providing that access to as many opportunities as we can, to as many markets as we can. And the, the, ma the magic will happen when those entrepreneurs are able to leverage on those opportunities. And only with time um, will we actually see what happens in those markets and where does it take them. Do you feel like you're not able to do enough? I mean, you know, 500, 500 startups, you know, at, at a goal of, of really trying to invest. I know you've gone way past 500 already. But, mm -hmm. you know, is it still sort of not enough? If you had 10 times the capital to deploy, would you really mm -hmm. be able to, to push that out there? I don't know. I don't know if I feel that there is not enough capital. Um, I think there's a lot of capital already in the market. And um, we need to be better about distributing that capital for sure. Um, but something that I do feel is never enough is human resources. I feel like there is never enough mentors, never enough time that can be dedicating coaching and supporting these entrepreneurs, never enough time that can be dedicating to allowing them networking opportunities, never enough human resources that can really leverage upon that. And I think that that's also something we're seeing, for example, in certain specific markets where now today, a lot of capital is going to, right? There's a lot of VC activity in Nigeria. You would be tremendously surprised. There's a lot of VC activity in Egypt. There's a lot of VC activity in all of these markets. So there's definitely... And, the thing about capital is it goes where it can grow. <laughs> and um, as, as investors, we know that capital will flow in markets where it can grow and multiply. That's how, that's the nature of how investment works. But I, I always will feel like there's not enough human resources to dedicate. I always wish that we could do more. Um, I wish that we could do more as institutions. I wish we could do more as individuals. I wish that we could create more knowledge transfer and that we could dedicate more time to helping those not make the same mistakes that we may have made in the past. So capital, I think that, of course, there should be more, but human resources to me is very much the one that we will never have enough of. Great. 
uh, Zinea, what you know, kind of coming back to this ecosystem question, yes. you know, what do you think uh, maybe the missing ingredients are, or what's holding them back? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you're still talking about uh, countries that are struggling. Um, they have infrastructure issues. They, uh, yes, there is a rising middle class, but at the same time, not, you know, the purchasing power is still low. Um, and, and, and so those, those problems haven't quite gone away. You know, the way might have been eased a little bit. There might be a better enabling environment, but you're still operating in countries that, that have those setbacks. That hasn't fundamentally changed. And, uh, and so those will always slow things down. Those kinds of factors will just, just slow it down. Um, I think the, the question about opportunity and and you know the access to opportunity rather is 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 massive. I'm sorry. Um, that's that is still fundamentally um, uh, lies in the realm of the few who were able to get an education in these countries. And a lot of times, just not any education, but an education that was a little more international in probably an English medium school and an English medium college, and that makes all the difference. Um, you know, so so again, uh, access to opportunity is still minimal and it isn't for everyone. You know, you're talking about countries with hundreds of millions of people in them. Um, and, and it's just the few that were able to do something. So, yeah, so those those problems still exist and that's slowing everything down. And maybe what Miriam, what you're saying, you know, is give it give it more time is maybe that is what is what is needed. You know, one thing that hasn't come up, but you know, I I think a lot of people, uh, you know, feel like is a, a drain in some sense on on growth mm. in, in mm. a number of these countries is corruption. Yes. Um, you know, to what extent is yes. you know corruption, whether it's at the highest levels or you know, kind of more mundane, uh, a real impediment to to business. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a huge impediment to business, and it's a huge impediment to the desire to be an entrepreneur. Frankly, um, you know, you have to have a different level of tenacity to be able to break through those barriers. And so, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, uh, uh, c corruption, or, or let's do the opposite. I mean, the enabling environment uh, for startups and for innovation has to have decent rule of law. You cannot um, innovate or, or you know, create enough entrepreneurship that will leapfrog that. I mean, that has to exist. So that is a very large impediment. Do you want to comment on that as well, Maram? Or? Yeah, no, I, I very much um, agree with Zenia. I th think that the effect of corruption, if anything, are also strongly psychological because, you know, entrepreneurship and especially the type of entrepreneurship we're talking about where we're utilizing technology and leveraging upon it is based on this common understanding that if you have a product market fit and a solution that actually has a demand for it in the market, it should work, right? So, it's that basic foundation that is completely broken uh, when there is corruption, because then it doesn't allow for that fair pursuit of a product market fit, because there are other factors that could either prevent that to happen or enhance that to happen. Um, and I think particularly in some emerging markets, it's been a historical barrier also towards trust. Um, and, and, you know, it's hard to build anything without trust. And it's hard to scale and sustain anything without trust. And that psychological barrier, um, I know that, you know, it's something that different countries have been really working toward eliminating to a certain extent um, and who have tried to do extensive work. But the reality is it's truly still very, very present. And it also kind of then destabilizes the ability of the entrepreneurs to really truly um, see the potential in themselves and in their products if there are additional factors that can either enhance that growth or block it completely. 
Yeah. Also, the radical swings, right, in some of these countries with the ruling parties, uh, you know, where it doesn't even necessarily happen every four or five years. It can happen a lot, lot quicker than that. So that fluidity, I mean, in a place like America, fine, you know, you know, your party might change, you know, with the president and all the rest of it, uh, your your. Uh, the party in control as such might change, but fundamentally that does not completely disrupt your business. Here again, it comes back to, I can't trust my government to even have consistent policy around a critical issue that will break or make my, uh, my, my, um, my venture. So, you know, and, and when you know that that could change every couple of years, then you're more hesitant to, to actually wade in those waters. Yeah, instability. I mean, instability. another, you know, mm-hmm. kind of interesting type of instability that's not even necessarily related to the kind of political instability uh, is even thinking about, you know, currency volatility. Uh, which is another uh, potential issue. And I guess, you know, that's mostly an issue when we're thinking about exporters. And I guess, you know, one of the things that I want to maybe come back a little bit to is, you know, we, we are seeing some really interesting innovations here. Are these going to be mostly for domestic consumption? Or do we really believe that these can become, uh, you know, engines for wealth creation by creating opportunities for exporting to other countries as well? I think a lot of them are are probably more regional uh, than than you know just widely globally um, um, adaptable, and so maybe more regionally adaptable. Um, also, let's go back to what we talked about you know at the beginning of this conversation about about these entrepreneurs really trying to solve a big hairy problem that exists for their society right where they are, which is, which is what we all want to encourage. And so just the nature of doing that um, sort of cuts back on the ability to be globally adaptable and, and you know, uh, expand in, in that way. So I think that depends on the industry and depends on, 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 the, on the startup itself. And, you know, these, these companies are not startups anymore. Some of them are huge uh, now. And so, yeah, there's, there's some regional transference that can happen. But for the most part, that's not what they were set up for. That's not what they were built for. And they have such enormous markets and such enormous potential right where they're at that the incentive to look across the seas is not as much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's something that's kind of, uh, I guess, related to this that just came in from the audience is, you know, what, what's a sector that you think actually needs more innovation in emerging markets, but that's not really getting attention? I would say, um, for me, it's a sector that I think is getting attention, but should get more, uh, and is definitely not getting as much as I think it should, uh, which is agri-tech and food systems. Because, you know, a lot of, you know, the excitement right now in emerging markets is, of course, around e-commerce and fintech, of course, because we're seeing some business model work. We're starting to see some benefit from, from actually investing in those type of companies. But let's also remember what technology and innovation is about, which is about sustainability. How do we create a world where we are constantly trying to do two things, improving the quality of life of the people who are in this world and increasing the length of that life. And so in improving the quality of life, um, it's incredibly important to think about food systems and agri-technology, especially in emerging markets where they base a lot of their actual raw resources in their natural resource. And technology is the best tool to enhance and kind of amplify that existing competitive advantage that they have, which is access to those resources. And so I'm a very big advocate for agri-tech and food systems. And I know that it's a sector that, you know, we have in vogue, but 
to me, it should be getting as much attention, as much investment as fintech with those e-commerce. And of course, it's a sector that takes longer to yield returns because there's a lot of R&D that goes into it. But to me, investing in agri-tech and food system is basically investing in the sustainability of our future and making sure that no matter how the technological development goes, we are creating sustainable systems that the next generation can actually fund themselves upon. All right, so Agritech and Zinnia? Education, all levels of it. Higher education, basic education. Um, yes, yes, there are innovations happening, not fast enough, not wide enough. Um, and honestly, you know, I would debate that it needs to happen in this country as well. That's a sector that is ripe for innovation and ripe for, for major disruption. There've been some disruptions, you know, people have tried, tried different things. They have and haven't worked, um, mixed results. But I think it's a sector that is ripe for massive disruption all across the board. Yeah, I mean, there's, at least in, in the US, there's obviously been a lot of attempts uh, to yeah. going to MOOCs and, yes. and other forms of online. You know, most of those have not been particularly successful. What, right. Why do you think they keep running into trouble? Well, I mean, the MOOC discussion is, uh, is a slightly separate one and a larger one, but uh, I think, the, you know, people have, have realized that uh, uh, everybody learns in very different ways and just having access to information, which we have access to all the information in the world right now, right? So having access to information isn't it. It is how people actually um, uh, Im imbibe that information and then regurgitate it and put it into action. Um, and, and that there is some power in the collective, in, the, in, in discourse, in the classroom uh, setting, whatever that might look like in today's world. I mean, look at us. We're all in different parts of the world right now and having great conversation. But there is power in discourse. There has always been power in discourse, all the way back to the Greeks, right? And that is how people have learned to, you know, and, and, and learned how to think critically. And uh, just having access to information, which is what the MOOCs did, doesn't allow people to really learn how to think critically and dialogue intelligently and actually uh, take away and adapt and create uh, from that knowledge base. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up. I, I think that, um, so, uh, Maram, you, you know, I believe that you, you said you're friends with Fred Swanaker, who is the founder of L ALA, and I'm sure you're aware that his latest uh, venture is sort of these ALUs. You know, what are, they're, they're basically trying to bring university education to the masses in some sense and in Africa. What, what are they doing differently? The success of, of ALU and ALA and the AL group um, as a whole has always been that um, the vision was to be able to allow to educate, but most importantly, to empower. And I think that that makes a very crucial difference because the ALU education, even in itself, is very much rooted in entrepreneurial education. So it's not only just about knowledge and how you acquire knowledge, it's what you do with that knowledge. And as a group, as the, the AL group, both ALU and ALA, the educations are also such centered around, you know, the African realities and the African economies that it's a, imagine a high quality education that's entirely centered around the realities where that education is happening. So providing examples that are rooted in the environment that the students are actually living in, providing applicable practice that are rooted in the environment that the students are in, and making sure that that knowledge then transfers into empowerment and really allowing those students to be able to transfer that into actionable items, again, in the environments that they live in. And I think that that truly made a difference. And ALU's hope is to be able to widespread that education to as many as possible. And that's what I was saying earlier around, we could never have enough um, human resources, we could never have enough education. And 
we, we, we really try to think about what are different models of education that can work on the continent because there are different models of education that can work. There's not only one way to educate. When we refer to education, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking about simply one kind of education, which could be a Western education, but really there are multiple different ways of going about education. And it's really about many different institutions bringing that different, those different aspects to the table. And so providing knowledge with empowerment and that being applicable to many different things. So the L group is doing it in one way. And there are also many other educational institutions on the continent that are also doing it differently, addressing different pieces of education, whether it be through art, whether it be through sport, whether it be through creative sports and, and, you know, I, I was actually quite amazed by an orphanage that I visited in Nairobi that is utilizing art therapy and creative sports like skateboarding to help kids who are in an orphanage feel reaccepted into society and feel reaccepted by themselves and others. So aside from just the academic education, the big piece of the orphanage is really around this art therapy and creative sport education to allow them to feel empowered so that they can use their academic education into something useful for them. And so education really has different aspects and is flourishing on the continent in different ways. And I think different groups are doing it differently, but the, the AL education in particular really leverages on that idea of empowerment to actually help um, kids do something useful with that education. Interesting. So, uh, you know, we could have this conversation, I think, for a, for a long time, but our time is uh, running short here. Uh, and uh, at least in this time zone, we are standing in front of uh, lunch. Um, so I, I want to, um, you know, kind of give, a, you know, kind of a brief chance to um, see if you have kind of last thoughts that you'd like to leave people with. Um, you know, that maybe we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Uh, Xenia, do you want to lead us off? Uh, you're on mute, though, Xenia. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, since we're talking uh, to a student body here, um, the markets are, are vast and the opportunities are vast globally. And um, a part of, of being in such a privileged school system here is um, being given the license, the permission to, to take a chance and to actually create something, uh, to fail at it, to lift yourself up again, and maybe never do it again, but also be enriched by the experience. And the experience, the journey of entrepreneurship and or innovation, because they don't always have to go hand in hand, you know, but of creating something new that might impact the lives of many and actually trying it, even if you fail, uh, at this point in your journey is, is, will just be so valuable for, for your entire life. And uh, a lot of us started after school, started later. And, um, and, and again, the privilege of having this kind of education and this sort of platform and where, where you are today at UCLA, um, you have the ability to do it while you're here. So take that chance and try it. Thank you. Maren? I, I will have to agree with everything that Zenia just said. The, the, you know, I think I realize the safe haven uh, of, of university once I was out of it um, in being able to really truly be in an environment where failing is success because then you're learning and you have the ability to learn while being protected and having a safety net and that's incredibly important because always ask yourself you know what's the worst thing that could happen if I'm about to start this project, I'm about to start this business idea, I want to start, what's the worst thing that could happen? I would do it. I'll probably fail in it. I'll go back to class, period. So really leverage and take advantage of that opportunity of being able to, to be in that safe haven, to fail as much as you possibly could so that you learn 
and you actually absorb as much as you can in such a short time frame, because that then you can actually take as a tangible outcome that will provide you with the ability to avoid some of those mistakes once you're actually leading your own ventures. And remember that at the end of the day, Try to have fun with it as much as possible. Building a company is fun. And it's fun because it's something that you get to do and you get to design and you get to go about it as in the way that you want. So remember that a big part of it is having fun. And that's why it's successful, because you're having fun while doing it, because you're finding meaning in doing it and you're actually harnessing that purpose. That's great. I think uh, both of those are excellent pieces of advice. And I hope that our students will uh, pay attention to them. And, and even our alumni may uh, benefit from thinking about those a little bit more. Um, you know, I, I think this has been a really interesting conversation. There's a couple of things that I would sort of highlight uh, that I think are, are interesting points here. Um, you know, one is, uh, you know, the importance of of you know, kind of stories and stories that are salient to, to individuals. So, you know, in my own research, I've actually uh, done some work on this. We we often call this peer effects, but you know, there's kind of this idea that uh, in order to believe that I can do something, I need to see somebody else do it. It's not necessarily about having the knowledge, but about understanding that, in some sense, you're empowered uh, to do that yourself. And and I think that that's uh, not just important to a lot of these emerging markets, but it's also you know, oftentimes I think why we see the sudden emergence of uh, ecosystems even in the United States, right? So like, you know, if you went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts in, you know, 1995, there wasn't a lot of startup activity there. Um, it had all the ingredients, except it didn't have this sort of uh, stories uh, of locals who had done it. Um, that changed very rapidly and now, you know, it rivals Silicon Valley uh, in the US as a startup ecosystem. Uh, I think a really interesting and important lesson that, that hopefully uh, the students will, will take away is uh, the value of thinking about basing your startup on solving a real problem. Uh, it, you know, really does then, uh, you know, in some sense, I, I, I mean, it's not necessarily easier because you know, that may actually be a really hard problem to solve. There's probably a reason why it's a problem, uh, but it does eliminate uh, some of the issues involved with uh, marketing, trying to create demand for something that perhaps uh, no one really needs. Uh, it could create other issues, as uh, Zinia pointed out. Uh, this you know, creates perhaps the need then for rapid, rapid scaling. Uh, and that's a different type of problem, uh, but in some sense, a good, it's a good problem to have. Uh, and the last uh, kind of point that I thought was just really interesting here, and, and, and I agree with, is that um, in some sense, the constraint is not you know, money or you know, kind of other types of institutional resources, but it's really the people. Uh, I love this idea that you know, there's never enough you know, kind of mentors, there's never enough you know, kind of network connections, uh, and anything that we can do to you know, kind of build that uh, capacity, uh, that supply, uh, would probably make more of a difference than any amount of dollars uh, thrown into these places. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. I'll, uh, I'll also thank the Easton Center and Terry, and I'll hand it back to Terry for uh, the you know, kind of final words. Thank you. Excellent. <clears throat> Great. Olaf, thank you very much. And let You're me welcome. thank the, uh, the panelists uh, here as well. Good learnings here, and especially on these enablers for what success is required. Let me add a couple of items to Olaf's point in terms of the so what's here. Um, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, that is a fundamental message about what are the market opportunities. And when they talked about education, they talked about agriculture, they talked about financial services, those are huge market opportunities. These are not niche opportunities. Candidly, a bit of helpful condemnation of U.S. entrepreneurs in very nice terms. So what was it that, that uh, uh, caused that? For U.S. Uh, entrepreneurs to think that they understand emerging markets, you're basically getting messages that say, you know what, we're learning more from Indonesia and from India, et cetera, into the African continent than we are from U.S. startups and European ones. So for all of you who are going to be involved in young startups and want to truly go global, that's an important warning sign about understand the markets you're, uh, you're going into. A couple last points just to, to add on. Leapfrog innovation. 
So I think Maureen was mentioning it in financial services. So credit cards and ATMs are old. They're passe. Mobile payments are the new things. By the way, you see this in China a lot. We find leapfrog innovation in payment-related activities. Final one, important uh, messages about taking risks and failing and making that part of the, the culture and all the things that Olaf said about how that becomes part of the enabling force for, uh, for success. So let's take a five-minute break or so, then we'll come back here for the final, uh, final panel. Thank you.